Hey guys, this is going to be a continuation of the discussion with theoretical BS. Rather than doing some defense, I'm going to be doing a bit of offense this time. So let's take a moment to understand his moral philosophy, and then let's critique it. He starts it off with a question. What do we mean when we call something morally right or morally wrong? Some people would answer that question by saying, Right is what we ought to do, and wrong is what we ought not do. Stealing is wrong because we ought not steal. But that doesn't answer the question now, does it? It just puts it into different terms. So from this we can see that right and what we should do are just different terms for saying the same thing. Next he gives a robust definition for what he means by right. A particular action or choice is moral or right when it somehow promotes happiness, well-being, or health, or it somehow minimizes unnecessary harm or suffering, or it does both. So what we can gather from this is that right, or moral, is synonymous with what we should do, and that those two are equivalent to that which maximizes happiness and minimizes suffering. Now you may recognize that definition is the same as the popular notion of utilitarianism. See if this sounds familiar, taken from John Stuart Mill's book, Utilitarianism, on page 7. He says, The greatest happiness principle holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to promote the reverse of happiness. So as you can see, half of his view is utilitarian. So now let's take a look at the other half. This is how he attempts to account for why we should be moral. It's rational to behave in certain ways in order to actualize a desired circumstance. We ought to behave in a certain way because doing so is the best known method for actualizing these circumstances. That is known as rational egoism. Now you may be thinking, what is rational egoism? But it's just a combination of two ideas. It's rational to achieve our goals, therefore we should achieve our goals. He sums it up in two words. Rational ought. Meshing the view of utilitarianism and rational egoism is going to cause you trouble. For one, you're going to inherit the problems associated with both of those views. And secondly, these two positions are often contradictory. Peter Singer, a prominent atheist and utilitarian philosopher, says it better than I can in his book Practical Ethics. He says, ethically indefensible behavior is not always irrational. In other words, the explanation you offer for why we should be moral is the same explanation that other people can use for why we shouldn't be moral. Now both utilitarianism and rational egoism have a host of problems, but let's start with rational egoism, and I'll save the best objection for last. 1. Rational egoism doesn't account for our conscience, that knowledge of what we should do regardless of what we personally want to do. Me and a fellow student did a research paper on business ethics. Now as part of that paper we conducted a survey, and the final version of that survey was fully completed by 176 students at our secular university. Now one of the questions on the survey was, why are you moral? The participants chose between four choices, because it benefits me, because it's the right thing to do, both, or neither. Now for this question, 3% chose because it benefits me, 47% chose because it's the right thing to do, 46% chose both, and the remaining 4% chose neither. In other words, 93% of the population gave an account for moral obligations that was not explained solely by egoism. In fact, egoism alone only explained 3% of the answers. People recognize an obligation to be moral independent of our personal gain, and your view simply doesn't account for that. When I say something like, rape is wrong, or, or slavery is wrong, I find that others are almost always on the same page, even without me telling them the definition I'm using for wrong. I know, it's almost like people have a conscience that allows us to innately recognize a realm of moral truths or something. 2. Pointing out that most people value a happy, healthy society is not only an appeal to majority, but it doesn't help your case. See, given rational egoism, society is not the primary value. Under your view, a happy, healthy society is just a method to achieve your primary goal, which is personal happiness. Benefiting the group is only rational insofar as it benefits you. Immoral actions that involve harming society, if they bring a greater benefit to you, are not irrational or inconsistent. And therefore, according to your moral philosophy, it's actually something you should do. 3. There are numerous instances in which harming a society would be in your rational self-interest. Now the best way to prove that is to use game theory, but I'm going to save that for my future video, Critiquing Ethical Egoism. But we can look at history to show us that immoral behavior is not always caught and punished, and that immoral people can prosper while moral people suffer. And I saved the best objection for last. Let's hear it in your own words. You can't derive an ought from the is of Christianity any more than you can from the is of atheism. The infamous is-ought gap. Now I showed you how I address this in my video. Let's see how you address it. 
But you also say, now You may object that what I'm talking about is not a moral ought, it's simply a rational ought. It's rational to behave in certain ways in order to actualize a desired circumstance. At no point does having a goal imply that you ought to achieve it, even if you precede the word ought with the word rational. See, your rational oughts don't bridge the is-ought gap. Merely having a desire doesn't imply that you ought to achieve it. Uh, this becomes obvious when you think about immoral situations. Just because someone may desire to cause harm doesn't mean that they ought to do it. Take a look at the type of contradictions that pop up in your view. Rape is wrong. This is a moral fact. And if a rapist places a higher value on the pleasure they get from raping someone than the value they place on that person's well-being, it follows for them that they ought to rape people. Your rational ought doesn't actually mean ought or should. Instead, it means must. See, if you're going to fulfill your desire to rape people, then you must commit rape. But at no point does that make any comment on what you ought to do. And I wanted to give an account of why we ought to do things which are right and ought not do things which are wrong. If that is your primary goal, then you must adopt a new moral philosophy. All right, on to a few brief objections to utilitarianism. This is the idea that we should maximize happiness and minimize suffering. First objection. Maximize happiness for who exactly? Monkeys? Or manatees? Oh, for mankind? How convenient. See, whether we're trying to maximize happiness for a specific species, or a specific country, or even a specific individual, it's all equally arbitrary. Let's start off the second objection with something you said. It's objectively wrong to keep slaves because keeping slaves objectively causes unnecessary harm and suffering. If slavery causes the greater happiness of society, once you factor in the suffering to the minority who are slaves, then under utilitarianism, slavery would be good. Now that is a tricky example because it has so many factors, so let's look at a more clear-cut example where utilitarianism is clearly immoral. Murder is wrong. What about when murder is consistent with utilitarianism? Let's imagine that you're a doctor and that you have five philanthropic CEOs in desperate need of an organ donor. Now imagine that you come across a homeless person that has no family. Now if you secretly kill this person and then harvest his organs to save the lives of the five philanthropic CEOs, you could maximize the benefit to society and in doing so maximize overall happiness. Now even though this action would be right from the utilitarian perspective, it is still intuitively immoral. So this leads us to the conclusion that utilitarianism is not equivalent to morality, because utilitarianism can be immoral. Now this also commits the fallacy known as post hoc ergo propter hoc, or as they say a bit more clearly in psychology, correlation does not equal causation. See, just because morality often maximizes happiness, it's still naive to then assume that maximizing happiness is what causes a thing to be moral. Under your view, right is not merely another way of saying what we should do, like you'd originally said in your video. In fact, the notion of right is completely detached from what we should do. You think that what we should do is what is in our rational self-interest, and it just so happens that what is in our rational self-interest occasionally coincides with what you've arbitrarily labeled as right. In short, your moral philosophy cannot account for why we should be moral, and even if your method worked, it would entail the contradictory conclusion that sometimes we ought to be immoral. And your definition of moral can include immoral acts, like we saw with the organ donor analogy. As far as I'm concerned, morality is a science. It is the science of maximizing social and societal well-being. In that case, teach the controversy. As always, test everything, hold on to the good.